Wednesday, September 30th, 2020 meeting of the Prince George's Forward Task Force. I'm Charlene Dukes, uh, one of the co-chairs of the task force, and I'd certainly like to introduce my colleague, Mr. David Velasquez. So, David? Welcome to everybody. It's great to see everybody again. Great to see all the progress we've been making. So what we'd like to do is uh, share a reminder that the meeting is being recorded and will serve as the official minutes of the full task force of the Prince George's Forward Task Force. And that's oh, been yeah. confirmed for us by the Office of Law. We're also going to ask that for those who will be um, speaking or presenting or have the opportunity <laughs> to ask a question, the task force members to please put yourself on mute. And uh, we do have one of our team members uh, of the support team who is who will certainly be watching to see if anyone has a question and um, will ask you to unmute yourself at that time to ask that question. So I'll go back and remind us again that the meeting is being recorded. Uh, that recording will serve as the official minutes that's been confirmed by the Office of Law and the recording will be placed on the website www.princegeorgesforward.com. That's www.princegeorges forward, F O R W A R D dot com. So, thanks to the task force members for joining us today and certainly for our public. This work is all about you and how Prince George's will move forward in an innovative and transformative way post COVID 19. So we're also joined today, or we will be joined by Chief Prince George's County Chief of Staff, Joy Russell. And as soon as she is able to get on, we'll halt where we are so that she can make some brief comments. She's and on. she has joined us. So she has joined us, so yes. thank you. Yeah. So yeah. with that, uh, and now I do see you, Chief of Staff Russell. Uh, so we'll turn the, um, meeting over to you for your uh, introductory comments and any brief comments that you'd like to make about the work of the task force. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dukes. You know, I am, I'm, I always try to be brief. So um, I just really wanted to say that the, the county executive and her leadership team are just grateful um, for the work, the amount of work and the quality of work that's been coming out of this task force. To date, we spent the last couple of weeks, as you know, going over um, quick wins. I've spent time with each of the um, subcommittee chairs and um, the amount of thought and the level of interest that that you all have really poured into this work um, was not was not lost on us. And it's clear that we have assembled a dedicated group of people who don't mind, you know, you don't mind rolling up your sleeves. Um, and we're looking forward to this next, next iteration of recommendations. Um, and just on behalf of the county executive, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've been doing. Dr. Dukes. Yes, uh, I was looking for the unmute button. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't uh, certainly share on behalf of the task force and, uh, and my co-chair our commitment to this work and our joy in understanding the kind of confidence that the county executive and actually the entire county government has uh, poured into us as we continue this work. And today, actually what we're going to do is to review what we're calling um, actions today. Uh, a week, two or three weeks ago, you would, have you would have heard these referred to as quick wins. And each of our subcommittees is going, chairs is going to have the opportunity to report out. Many of you are aware if you um, were on the full task force call, if you've been reviewing the emails we've been sending, and if you have been certainly tuning in to the public meetings, that there were a total of 47 quick wins submitted to the county executive for her, for her review and approval. Mr. Velasquez and I had the opportunity to meet with County Executive also Brooks, Chief of Staff Russell, uh, the support team, Glenda Wilson, Miriam Brewer, David Sloan, and, uh, and Deputy CAO uh, Tara Jackson. 
to review the quick wins and to provide any additional information that we could that would be helpful in coming to a final decision. We are so proud and pleased today to have everyone know that of the 47 quick wins that were submitted, 38 have been approved to date. The final nine are still in review, some of which will be sent back to the subcommittees so that we can conti continue to flesh out the uh, implementation strategies and of course, the funding that would need to support that. So a, an important and critical part of our meeting today is to do a final walkthrough of the first phase of the task that we took upon ourselves as the task force. Uh, the report we should uh, let you know will be finalized today and it will be made public next Monday, October 5th. That means that each of the task force members will, re will receive the full report and the full report will be released uh, by placing it on the website. Um, that we know that while this phase is being finalized that we still have work to do. And that is to continue our dialogue and discussion, both within the five subcommittees and the full task force as we think about short-term and long-term recommendations. So I want to thank everyone for your hard work. And I know that, that Dave will do the same as soon as um, we get to his portion of this agenda. Um, we can all agree that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought some unprecedented and maybe uh, unanticipated challenges to how we live and work and I would say play. So being a part of the county executive's ambitious plan to reimagine the county's future is both humbling and it's really inspiring to work with each one of you. So the county executive has asked the forward task force to release its recommendations in three phases. The first phase being immediate actions, those actions today that can be implemented right away. We're all working and presenting in real time. It's a serious commitment and shows all of your dedication to the residents of Prince George's County and in many ways to the state of Maryland and the region in which we live. From the outset, the forward path task force was charged with providing concrete, actionable recommendations across a broad spectrum of policy areas to both aid Prince George's, Prince George's recovery and to equip the county to better respond to future crises. So we want to thank the leadership team of the task force subcommittees, and we are doing just that. It is because of your work that we are where we are today. We are grateful for our subcommittee leaders and our work group members who are giving so much of your time and your talent. You are dedicating much thought to how we can move forward more efficiently and better deliver county services, again, across five broad areas. The work demanded that we bring together the brightest leaders and problem solvers and thinkers in our area. Our task force subcommittees are led by experienced, committed and thoughtful leaders who are experts in their fields and share a deep understanding and deep commitment to our county. They're comprised of Prince Georgians and Marylanders who are diverse in background and professional experience, united by their commitment to ensuring a thriving future for Prince George's County. The impressive knowledge and practical know-how will help our county emerge from this pandemic stronger than ever before. And I would dare say in more ways where we will be more transformative and innovative than we had ever thought possible. So with that, what I'd like to do is introduce the co-chair of the Prince George's Forward Task Force, Mr. David Velasquez. Dr. Dukes, thank you. And, and we're gonna move into the next part of the agenda, which is to uh, summarize the actions today, or, or as some folks have called them, the quick wins. I just wanted to reemphasize two points that, uh, or three points that Dr. Dukes made. First, to echo all her comments about the great work and, and the level of expertise and talent that all the uh, subcommittee chairs and all the subcommittees have brought to this. And, and thank you for your time, attention, and energy to bring forward such, such good recommendations. Uh, second of all, just to, to reiterate that um, besides this report around actions today that, that we're talking about in these, these recommendations, There'll be two additional rec uh, reports that come out, uh, what, what we're calling Visions for Tomorrow, 
and a redefined future, which are really the shorter and the longer term recommendations. And those will be coming out in the coming months as well. So what we've asked and are asking each of our subcommittee chairs to do today is give us a summary of the approved recommendations from their respective areas. And again, as Dr. Dukes has alluded to, just because a recommendation was not approved and is not moving forward um, in this phase, uh, they're being considered in the visions for tomorrow or the redefined future uh, as well. So um, we'll just, we'll I'll turn it over and, and we'll go through each of the uh, subcommittee chairs. And first, uh, we will have the opportunity to hear from the Honorable Martin O'Malley, who's a former governor of Maryland and the chair of the Government Operations Subcommittee to briefly uh, preview his subcommittee's approved recommendations. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Mr. O'Malley. And thank you very much. And, th and thank you both for your, your leadership of this task force. Uh, I have had the joy of working with uh, not only my co-chair, Terry Spigner, but also with Tara Jackson and some really terrific uh, people, Wanda Gibson, um, uh, Sean Stokes, and, and others that are part of this government operations task force. So um, one, of the, one of the very, very important aspects of uh, government operations is assuring an orderly election. So uh, uh, the people have already started voting uh, and we have been involved uh, in a, you know, um, ongoing way uh, with all of those responsible for making sure that people of Prince George's and their piece of this election is handled in, a, in an orderly way, even in light of COVID. So I'm gonna set that on the side though. And I wanna focus on the five quick wins. Uh, number one, it was, uh, to perform an inventory of those customer facing services, the sort of services that citizens of the county, businesses uh, need uh, on a daily basis to determine which ones can actually be transitioned to online. Um, and uh, the second, uh, and so that is an inventory of customer facing services. Uh, the second is, uh, to provide continuity of operations uh, plan training for employees responsible for those continuity of operation plans. The reality that we're dealing with is the likelihood that we will face 40% absentee rates at some point in the course of putting down this pandemic uh, until there's a vaccine. The other reality that we're dealing with is that in order to, uh, uh, in order to be safe, it is best to observe social distancing. Uh, therefore, doing as much as we can online is the goal. And uh, so how do you come up with the continuity of operations plan that allows you to do that? Uh, the third recommendation is continuity of operations plan training for the appointing authorities. Each department's different. Each one has to game through how they go about doing the job that the people of Prince George's County need for them to do every day, but to do it in remote settings. Uh, the uh, fourth recommendation has to do with revising the county's remote work uh, policies to make sure that they're flexible, uh, that uh, provide alternatives uh, for telework and provide training for managers, employees and, and employees as to how to implement that. So a revision of remote work policies. In the past, all of our remote work policies were designed to discourage remote work. Now we need to flip that script in a pandemic, figure out how we can encourage it while also making sure we get the job done for the people of Prince George's County. And then the fifth recommendation is uh, to begin the digitization of documents. Uh, in other words, moving them from uh, paper documents to things that can be accessed online and remotely to make sure that important work gets done. Uh, so uh, that's a big task, but we're already underway with digitizing uh, documents uh, it, it, that will allow uh, important work in HR or whether it's inspections to actually happen without the need for employees to physically go into a workplace and, uh, and be proximate to other people while they go through a uh, paper file. So that's the report of the five quick wins. Uh, again, by summary, in, that is an inventory of customer facing services. 
uh, continuity of operations uh, training and plan development, continuity of operations training for appointing authorities, revision of remote work uh, policies and digitization of documents. Thank you very much. Governor, thank you for that, uh, that, that summary, all important actions um, moving forward. Um, now we're gonna turn to uh, Dr. Darren Pines, who's the president of the University of Maryland College Park and chair of the education subcommittee to briefly walk through uh, their approved recommendations. Dr. Pines. Uh, thank you, co-chair Velasquez, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about the education subcommittee, recovery committees, um, seven recommendations. But first, let me thank my committee members. We had a diverse group of folks from industry, government, and academia. And we um, were broken up into five SFAs um, to sort of so to distill out these sort of seven um, quick wins. We had some incredible speakers. Uh, we had Dr. Golson and Dr. Thornton to share with us the county's perspective on the public school system. We had Dr. Karen Salmon as a speaker talking about Maryland State Superintendent of Schools. And we had uh, famous Dr. Britt Kerwin about the Kerwin Report. This all informed us of what we were gonna do in terms of recommendations for Prince George's County and how it would move forward in a post-COVID world. We know we all have been challenged in education, K-12 probably the most, but our committee has worked diligently to come up with these incredible uh, quick wins for the county. And so I'd like to share them with you. Number one, maximize education funding opportunity. So this is a, an idea to essentially leverage all of the state's funding and opportunity that it presents from the state of Maryland, including the current commission's recommendations, but also to go after federal and CARES Act money during this critical time period so that the county and the school system can move forward expeditiously on initiatives for the county. So that's really important. Number two, addressing crisis with deliberate dialogue. So as we all know, we're in this sort of weird state in 2020, where we're not only dealing with the virus, but we're also dealing with social unrest and social injustice. So we need to have deliberate conversations with our students, our faculty, our staff, and have these authentic conversations about racism, police brutality, and other topics. And so this is something about really uh, sustaining the mental health and providing services to, both, to all our faculty, staff, and students during this uh, time of crisis. So addressing crisis with deliberate dialogue. Number three, bridging the digital divide. Uh, still in our county, there are a number of students and families without high bandwidth Wi-Fi without devices so that they can actually be in a virtual modality of learning. This is unacceptable for us to be in this state and we must solve this problem. This is not just a quick win, but a short-term and a long-term win going forward to really sustain the county's ability to do virtual learning. Number four, anytime, any place learning. Again, this is about immediate access to virtual learning and so this is an idea related to 24 hours, seven days a week, student access to online materials. So if something happens synchronously or asynchronously that a student and its family can get access to that material at any time of the day. So this is any time, any place learning. That's number four. Number five, a holistic approach to student well-being. I mean, all of us are under a lot of stress and families are under even more stress. Um, so services holistically throughout the county's educational enterprise must be provided to families to ensure their well-being, so that their students and their sons and daughters can actually have virtual learning in a healthy environment. So a holistic approach to student well-being is really important uh, going forward. Number six, digital empowerment program. So this is about a communications campaign to make sure that we get to all of our citizens of the county to make sure they know about the, the digital resources that, that we're providing them and that are available to them, even in the library system, that they can actually go to our local libraries and get hi-fi, high uh, bandwidth Wi-Fi uh, at our local library systems and other services. So this is a communications strategy going forward for Prince George's County K-12 and P-20 schools. And then finally, the seventh area is a universal laptop program. So obviously, again, I mentioned that we, we need to have students having the devices, the appropriate devices for them to be able to learn and the appropriate software on those devices for them to be able to learn in a virtual uh, modality. So these are our seven wins and I'll just really say them really quickly. Number one, um, maximize education funding opportunity. 
Number two, addressing crisis with deliberate dialogue. Number three, bridging the digital divide. Number four, anytime, any place learning. Number five, holistic approach to student well being. Number six, digital empowerment program. And number seven, a universal laptop program. Thank you. Dr. Pines, thanks for that, that summary. And, and as we all know, education is so critical to us and our children and success moving forward uh, as well. Um, now I want to turn to uh, Ms. Rosie Allen Herring, President and CEO of the United Way of the National Capital Area, who chaired the Human and Social Services Subcommittee. Ms. Allen Herring. Thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair Velasquez, as well as uh, certainly Chair uh, Dr. Dukes and, and the County Executives of um, Absence, I certainly salute her. And thank you so much for um, your leadership, uh, Chief of Staff Russell. The, the Human and Social Services Group continues to do its work um, along with a great group of professionals that are certainly led by, by Mr. Sloan with Madison Gray, Carrie Ann Pert, uh, Edward Jefferson, Patrick Callahan, and of course my co-chair, Dr. George Askew, who works, I think, extremely well. As you know, the task force has been tasked with a couple of different areas of looking at the immediate needs uh, for families in real time, uh, four key areas, immediate needs of families in real time, integrating data for individual recovery and resilience, strengthening partnerships across the county, as well as looking across all three of those areas of focus with an equity lens. And in doing so, we partnered with plenty of external partners, as well as bringing the subject matter expertise of many of the county professionals who bring that, that, that lens to our, to our work, including, of course, Director Burnett, as well as Director Elena Butler. As we look at the areas of focus for us in terms of the, the now I think we're calling them actions today, if you will, many have been approved already, and then we still, of course, have work to go. They're really around formalizing partnerships. As we recognize, um, there, are, uh, there are many partnerships that are going on in the county, but we think that there is a need to look for efficiencies in terms of the interaction and the engagement to ensure that we're leveraging the best that we can bring uh, to the table with all of the work that's being done. We also are looking at a community mask access campaign. As this um, pandemic ensues, and we believe that it will be for the foreseeable future, uh, PPE and, and other uh, I guess preventive measures, if you will, will still very much be a need and we have to ensure uh, that we have the opportunity to be able to share them with everyone. Creating a list of home-based support systems. Again, we're identifying current uh, systems that are there in an effort to leverage them for greater efficiency and effectiveness throughout the county. We're looking at uh, senior nutrition sites and what it will take to give seniors the comfort level to return to those sites and what it will look like until we get there and how are the services that they are used to receiving still being given to them. Food distribution coordinator, we were calling this a food distribution czar, um, that again, the county council, we're proud to say has already placed as a part of the fiscal 21 year budget. We are also looking at a PSA that, that gives, I think the, the general public the, the basic knowledge around eviction protections so that they understand what are their rights and what they have access to in terms of being able to save their homes as well as their, their, their rental properties as well. And we're looking to really leverage the nonprofit sector by creating a nonprofit and faith-based directory. Again, as I shared at the outset, there are a plethora of, of organizations that are doing phenomenal work on the ground, serving families every single day. But we wanna ensure that we're not doing it in a disparate message um, um, manner, that we're able to bring them together and find out where there's opportunity for leverage and where they may have the opportunity to grow their capacity to serve even more. And finally, we're looking at a county senior liaison, um, 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 living liaison for many of our seniors. We recognize that that is a critical population that we need to ensure is served in the, in the county. And we want to ensure that they are able to, to move this work forward in terms of being able to find out what their needs. Now, those are the ones that are approved to this point, Madam Chair and Mr. Chairman, but the work continues in terms of being able to look at additional efforts. As this work continues, we'll be looking at uh, other segments of society, such as those who are aging out of foster care. We're looking at other you know, um, opportunities that we have to be able to look at work with regards to a universal um, referral system. We're looking at a telephone reassurance program. We're looking at, um, again, what we call the OASIS program, which is offering affordable solutions and sustenance. 
so as we continue to do that work, we know that this will be a living document, um, that this will continue to, to bring the best that we have forward. I do want to acknowledge a few of the uh, subcommittee task force members that I happen to see on here. And if I miss you, please forgive me. Uh, but I do see Judge Sheila Tillis Adams from the, from the court system. I do see uh, Tammy Bresnahan from AARP. And again, we have significant faith-based representation as well as, of course, uh, county professionals who offer subject matter expertise. We will continue to do the work uh, in partnership with our partner at EY who will be offering us benchmarking opportunities and workshops. We're looking to also benchmark best practices with other jurisdictions and municipalities. Um, we will have coming to us, Mr. Ramin Kuzakanini, who is with the Hillsborough, Florida, uh, Hillsborough County, Florida. Um, um, again, their offices in terms of being able to share with us how they've been able to really and truly bring much of this work to light. So Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman, we certainly submit to you that the work continues. Uh, we will continue to bring our best to it, and we look forward to bringing you visions uh, for tomorrow as well as redefined futures. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Allen Hearn, thank you, Board. And, and as we all know, this this started as a health emergency, continues as a health emergency. So, all the recommendations in the human and social services area are so critically important uh, for our community. I also did just want to emphasize a point that uh, Rosie had made about the fact that. What we're talking about today, all these are approved recommendations that the county has funded and that, that the county is moving forward on. And that just to me is just so impressive when you think these are 38 new initiatives designed to help Prince Georgians, to help the county move forward, not tomorrow, not the next day, but to start moving forward today, which is why I would call them um, actions today. So I just wanted to remind folks, um, uh, remind folks of that. Um, now wanted to turn it over. And if I may, I just wanted to reiterate that we had nine um, um, of the approved um, actions for today that we wanted to just make certain for the record. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, now I wanted to turn it over to uh, Dr. Joe Wright, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of um, the Capital Region Health University of Maryland Medical System, who chairs the Health Recovery Subcommittee to briefly walk through the recommendations from their uh, subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to move through our actions today and uh, want to acknowledge all the support from, from staff, uh, uh, specifically Linda Turner and Ryan Milton, who have certainly um, facilitated um, our movement through our, our specific focus areas, um, which include health operations, preparing for the next wave, infrastructure needs, and equity, care coordination, and filling gaps. And what I will do is to uh, take each of those specific focus areas in turn and uh, speak to the actions today that align with those specific focus areas. Um, in terms of, of health operations, uh, the, the focus here was to really uh, continue to do to uh, implement what has worked and uh, the focus there uh, had largely to do with communications with the public mass communications and notifications through SMS text messaging was felt to be a, a very important um, um, innovation and, and uh, tactic for accomplishing mass communications uh, during the pandemic. Also the uh, COVID hotline, sustainability and efficiency. There was a, a hotline established during the course of the, uh, uh, of the early days of the pandemic and a recommendation to continue to transition uh, that hotline uh, in terms of sustainability and improving its efficiency uh, were recommendations coming out of health operations. The subgroup that was working on preparing for the next wave uh, we had the benefit to have the benefit in this group in particular of being able to leverage uh, several of the health system leaders who have been uh, leading um, our uh, various hospitals through the pandemic participating in this group. And uh, here we have four um, actions today that have emerged from that experience of, of not only being 
uh, in the heat of response, but also um, looking ahead as we are literally on the precipice of yet another wave of this pandemic. So those four uh, actions today include refining the process for dissemination of resources in real time. And we all experienced challenges that last spring in terms of the actual process for getting the resources to where they needed to be in the right time. Also, uh, the establishment ahead of time of an MOU for quarantine facilities. We all recognize the need for either recovered individuals, individuals who um, required uh, quarantine, the need to have these, th these relationships in place um, ahead of time. And, and certainly this is a very important uh, action today as we uh, look forward to the next wave. Uh, also, the a countywide debrief on best practices and lessons learned. If, if nothing else can be said about this uh, a pandemic, we have learned a great deal in terms of the actual provision of, of delivery of care. We've learned a great deal about the, the, uh, the, the science behind the way that this novel coronavirus impacts our, our, our community and our individual patients. And we thought that it was critically important for us to um, very uh, uh, deliberately to codify those best practices and lessons learned as we move forward. And then um, another uh, action today from this particular subgroup preparing for the next wave was streamlining the county's PPE purchasing power, integrating supply chain representation in with the leadership of the healthcare system so that we have a, again, a real time finger on the pulse of what PPE needs are um, in real time around the health systems. So again, preparing for the next wave, I, I, I just call this, this particular um, uh, specific focus area out because we are still obviously going through this and uh, we're delighted that the, uh, this process has um, identified these, these uh, actions today as approved. The next specific focus area has to do primarily with the health department and infrastructure needs to bolster the health, the health department's ability to not only respond, but to actually um, engage in the delivery of public health on the ground, uh, preventive measures and mitigation strategies. And uh, the, the, the uh, actions today having to do with that level of support included uh, a health department funding infographic. Well, what do we mean by that? One of the um, challenging areas that we heard repeatedly throughout the course of the um, our activities is the fact that uh, the health department funding stream needs to be more uh, flexible and needs to be um, uh, such that we can have the level of response from um, uh, county funds and not be as hamstrung or constricted by grant funds coming from state or federal sources. So the importance of that uh, level of knowledge in, in the context of, a, of an infographic was one of the um, actions today that was approved. Also establishing a health department assessment team. And uh, uh, again, the health department is so pivotal and so critical in all of the work that we're doing in, in, in this effort that um, really an up to from, from top to bottom assessment of where we need to uh, improve, where we need to tweak, uh, where we need to, to support in a more robust fashion. The need for the health department is a uh, action today. And then uh, also coming out of that infrastructure group uh, is the need to develop a negotiated indirect cost reimbursement agreement. Well, uh, that, that sounds um, like finance. Well, it is finance. It is, it is looking at how we uh, ensure that the overhead and the indirect cost needs of the health department in, in managing the many, many grants that they uh, have in their portfolio comes with the uh, negotiated rate to support that overhead. And this is something that not only applies to the health department, but obviously to any um, uh, grants that would be coming into county government. And then the last group uh, for spe specific focus was equity, 
care coordination and filling gaps. And uh, this group really was quite focused on our workforce and, and um, the number one action today from that group was simply support for our healthcare workforce. And this is something that is critical as we move through uh, the pandemic, uh, support not only in terms of keeping them safe, but also support in terms of their um, behavioral health and well-being. And, uh, and certainly this is a, a, a high area of focus for those of us in the, in the healthcare delivery system, as well as those who are on the front lines and other means uh, such as um, first responders. And then uh, the last action today from that group is focused on uniform data collection to address diversity and equity. Uh, what do we mean by that? Ensuring that all of the county contractual relationships uh, require require the uniform data collection to identify who is being served, to make sure that there is equity and equitable distribution of grant uh, supported funding to the community. Uh, this was uh, felt to be a, a, a an area of high priority uh, for our group and is one of the um, actions today that was approved. This group also um, submitted to two uh, actions today that have been moved into the short and long-term category. Uh, one having to do with developing a financially sustainable model to support uninsured individuals and make sure that there's access to health care for the uninsured or underinsured. That has been moved to a, um, a short and long-term recommendation uh, trajectory. And then finally, our last action today is to identify an effective equity and anti-racism training module for all county employees to attend. Uh, this again has application across all of our all of our work groups and uh, has been moved to uh, from action today to a short and long-term recommendation. So that is uh, a summation of the 13 actions today that have emerged from our four specific focus areas and and Mr. Chair I, I turn it back over to you. Thank you. Dr. Wright, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for the reminder as well, the fact that we all need to be preparing for the for the second wave of this as it comes. And um, I'll also note that that uh, we didn't design this as a competition that after Rosie mentioned that she had nine, that, you know, you need <laughs> you 13. And, and now as we turn to Mr. Graham, I mean, I'm sure he's got 15 or 20 that, that uh, he's going to bring forward. Um, but anyway, I, I, I do also want to remind everyone on the call um, at the end of, of um, Mr. Graham's presentation, we'll have gone through all the, the subcommittees. And uh, if you have a question, um, you know, please use the chat, the chat box to, to put your question in there. And, and we'll take some time at the end um, after Mr. Graham speaks to, to answer any questions uh, that anyone has. So with that, let me turn it over to Mr. Tom Graham of TH Graham and Associates, who's the chair of the Economic Recovery Subcommittee. And, present a summary of, of his recommendations and his groups. Tom. So Dave, thank you. Um, we did not have 15. Uh, I think the ask was six and we provided five. So we're, we're satisfied with that. Uh, none of it could have been possible without the team members. Uh, I have an extraordinary group of leaders uh, on my uh, subgroup. Uh, I have about 22 uh, all together. Uh, also, the support of DCAO, Angie Rogers, and the entire economic uh, development cluster, you know, has been very important. And then my right-hand person now, Brandon Starks, uh, has been uh, a valuable resource that's been provided to us. Uh, just to keep everyone grounded, we are provided with seven specific areas of focus, job recovery, workforce development, business recovery, tourism recovery, economic relief, real estate recovery, policy tools and resources, and uh, mass transit guidance. Uh, I have four particular leaders I'd like to identify. David Harrington and Kerry Watson uh, dealt with uh, job and wealth creation. And then real estate and mass transit were Jair Lynch and Corey Neal. Uh, we went through a process. We had about eight presentations that were given to us. It's a lot of information uh, to absorb, but we are very pleased to find out that all five of our recommendations uh, were accepted. Um, 
so I'll start with the first one, and these are in a prioritized order. Uh, Shovel-ready projects. These are to advance projects that are fully funded um, in, during the fourth quarter. This is important because this creates jobs. This also decreases the faster these job these projects move, it decreases the costs that are associated with um, uh, for the developer. So we're happy about that. Uh, part of this also includes a marketing campaign, which would be signage at these locations that would say, you know, this is a, a COVID-19 priority project. Um, some language to the effect of, you know, by order of a county executive, uh, Angela also Brooks. So this sends a message that we're open for business and that the county executive is pushing forward with economic development projects, which is important, I think, for everyone to, uh, to know. Uh, number two is the Green Book. So the Green Book is a guide for county-based small businesses and county-based minority businesses enterprise, enterprises to connect millions of dollars in procurement opportunities within the Prince George's County government. So this is important to, uh, to assist small and minority businesses and create that money flow within Prince George's County, which is very important at this time. Now that uh, the Green Book's being updated right now, and uh, the first, um, my first view of it, there were some great opportunities in there that people need to take advantage of. But you know, one of the things that we need to do, and as part of our recommendations, we need to have a campaign that registers more uh, small minority businesses within the supplier diversity office. Uh, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with individuals who talk about the fact that they have a business in Prince George's County but they haven't done any business, been able to do any business with the Prince George's County government, and then go on to tell me that they're not registered with the supplier diversity office. So, so the point of this is really to, uh, to drive the number of uh, uh, small minority businesses uh, to get registered in order to take advantage of the opportunities identified in the Green Book. So our third uh, recommendations on technical assistance providing small and minority businesses are uh, reopening resources, a uh, one area that they can go to uh, to collect information to help them move forward. You know, I, I think a good example of this is something that the EDC has released now, Emerge Stronger Business Resilience uh, Program for Prince George's County. Uh, these type of things are very important. Again, I, I run into a number of businesses that aren't aware Oh, the resources that are available to them uh, through the government and through other resources, uh, through other entities. Our fourth um, recommendation is mass transit. And in the mass transit recommendation, uh, the idea is increased bus service and high area needs uh, to support mobility of essential workers and county residents. As we start to move to higher phases and open up more, it's gonna be very important uh, for our residents to be able to get to the locations that they uh, they need to get to. And our final recommendation was uh, by PGC. Uh, it's an existing initiative. Uh, it's to provide online listing of businesses in Prince George's County that are currently open with a special emphasis towards retailers and restaurants. Um, this is important because we want to be able to keep our money with inside Prince George's County and support our businesses uh, in Prince George's County. Uh, we need to work on a uh, and more advanced uh, platform uh, for this, but this would be very helpful to support uh, our local businesses. Uh, our next steps are to work on short and long-term long recommendations. We've already started that process. Uh, we've off to a great start. Uh, and then in closing, I wanna uh, thank uh, County Executive also Brooks and the entire leadership team for their support of our initiatives. And we look forward to uh, continuing this very, very important work for Prince George's County. Thank you very much. Mr. Graham, thanks. Thanks for the summary. And, and as we all know, the how we come out of this from an economic standpoint is going to be so critical to us as well. Um, I see we have a couple questions and, and um, maybe we can just uh, run through them. The uh, first one is directed towards the government uh, ops group and, and maybe they've seen the question already from council member Mel Franklin. Are we including 100% conversion from paper to completely digital submission a development and permitting plans uh, with DPI. So, um, Governor O'Malley, you're still on.
or we can ask, I see DCAO, DCAO Tara Jackson is on. Maybe she can answer that uh, as well as one of the co-leads for uh, government operations. I can, I don't see Governor O'Malley, so I'll jump in. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the agency is, uh, is poised to provide 100% digital submissions. However, the agency does recognize that some of our customers um, cannot currently avail themselves of, of the technology. So we want to make sure that we uh, uh, make room for those customers who um, are not as technologically savvy as uh, yet as we would like for them to be. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, second question I see is for the Health and uh, Human Services uh, Subcommittee. The RAND Corporation just completed a new health and human services study about Prince George's County, made specific recommendations for steps forward in the near future that can be incorporated in the health and human services uh, recommendations and then a, uh, a URL for the study. So I guess it's not really a question, but more um, comment to make sure that the uh, Health and Human Services group is looking at that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure they will. And I don't know if anything else you wanted to, to comment. Uh, sure, sure, Mr. I, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Franklin uh, for, for circulating the URL. Um, yes, um, a, a number of us have been um, actually involved in, in uh, this second iteration of the RAN report. I'll just say that um, very comprehensive report that dropped yesterday in, in its full form and was presented at the Board of Health. Um, one of the things that is, uh, is really critical in terms of um, our approach in implementing specific recommendations emerging from reports like this is that uh, the last RAN report was published in 2009. Um, and we, we need a, a much more regular uh, cadence with the way that we enact and react and be proactive uh, as we've talked about in, in these uh, actions today uh, with our response to what is uh, obviously uh, now a triple pandemic uh, if you include the um, racial and social inequities along with the economic barriers uh, doubling down on, on the health challenges. So again, thank you, Council Member Franklin. And um, uh, not only is there a link to the full deck here, but I also believe there is a, a link uh, to the presentation slide deck that the RAND Corporation presented yesterday. Thank you. Um, before we move on, any final questions uh, from anyone? Okay, well, um, again, I wanna thank the, the co-chairs and all the task force members again for, for the tremendous work you've done. And, and again, how important, just stress how important this is for um, the county to move forward. And, and um, uh, again, reiterate that, that 38 of these have already been approved, funded and are moving forward. And, and some of the other ones, uh, as was noted, are being considered in, in the uh, shorter term and longer term recommendations. So just because it was not is not moving forward and approved right now doesn't mean that it's been dropped off the list as well as dropped off the list. So with that, let me turn it over to, to Dr. Dukes to talk a little bit about the um, official actions today uh, report and that release. So before we get there, I do want to let Dr. Pines know that we have some breaking news. Um, we do have an eighth um, recommendation that was approved for the education task force and that was the expansion of dual enrollment. And um, so that, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of this in real time as, as you all can uh, both hear and see. And uh, we're excited about that because in working with the Prince George's County Public School System, it will certainly allow uh, young people to access higher education much earlier than maybe they would have realized was possible. So I don't know, Dr. Pines, if I can turn it over to you and you talk about what the expansion of dual enrollment had the opportunity to do based upon the recommendations from the education subcommittee. I think it's an activity that's um, been going on um, in terms of partnerships with the higher education community in Prince George's County. So Bowie State University, Prince George's Community College and University of Maryland College Park have been expanding these relationships 
uh, with the K-12 system. And so we thought this was an easy, quick win. And we're happy to know that everyone's going to support it now. So we, we, we got three more that we didn't get supported. So we'd love to get those supported as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm just getting, I'm trying to get our numbers up to like 11, not 15, but like to 11. <laughs> but thank you very much for that news. We're, we're very happy to hear that. Thank you. And uh, as we all know that that um, those additional nine, I believe, and I believe that dual enrollment expansion was part of the 38, but if it wasn't and it's number 39, what we know is those, are those that are remaining, we're asking you to go back to your um, uh, subcommittees, talk with your subcommittee members with regard to shorter term or longer term recommendations. And then we'll begin to figure out what the, uh, the, the fiscal analysis of the recommendations as we move forward. And that's certainly a comment for all of the uh, uh, subcommittees. I'll also indicate to everyone that the task force is primed to receive progress reports from the responsible areas of county governments or the responsible agency as they move to implementation. So we will stay connected to the work uh, because we do believe that we have both an interest and a responsibility to ensure that the work is moving forward. Our short-term recommendations are due to uh, Mr. Velasquez and me um, on or about, I believe, October 14th. So that lets you all know that we, we have a cadence around the recommendations and uh, wanting to keep moving those forward. Um, we're also, and have had the opportunity to talk with a few of the subcommittee chairs and we'll certainly reach out to the others, but there is also consideration of the potential for legislative review and action for some of the um, action today or quick wins that are coming forward, as well as the short-term recommendations. And those le that legislative action or review for potential action would occur both at the local level and uh, at the state level. So we're not only thinking about what can we do um, you know, relative to the resources that we have on hand, both human and financial, but are there potential policy decisions or legislative decisions that will emanate from our work? So as you continue your work with the uh, full task force and those who are members of your subcommittees, also be thinking about whether or not there uh, continue to be legislative opportunities around the recommendations that you will make. You've already mentioned, I think, Dr. Pines, the Kerwin Commission and um, uh, you know the Kerwin report and, and the like. And I know that there will be certainly some forward movement with the support of that as we think about the next legislative session. So um, I expect that we'll get uh, similar kinds of um, recommendations from each of the other um, subcommittees as well. So just want to again reiterate our thanks. If there are any other questions um, in the chat box, I think Ms. Brewer, you'll let us know. So we want to make sure that we're answering every question or certainly um, giving the opportunity for any comments. Yes, we do have a question. It is from Terry Spigner. Do we have a consolidated list or presentation of the quick wins identified by the subcommittees? So Terry, what we'll do is um, we are actually putting that together um, as uh, we are on this uh, in this meeting and uh, each of the task force members will receive the full document and the report will be released on Monday uh, on the uh, public website of Prince of uh, you know our path forward work, so absolutely you will receive it. And if there are other questions, uh, Ms. Brewer will certainly monitor the chat box. But we are going to move to the next agenda item, and I believe we have with us Sheila O'Connell and Kate Coleman of McKenna Media, and they're going to share the communications plan for the public release of the report and uh, also remind us as task force members of our communication <laughs> protocols. And that includes print, visual, um, uh, social media and the like. So I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. O'Connell and Ms. Uh, Coleman at this time. Great, thank you. Thank you so much co-chairs and all of you today for inviting us onto the call. Um, 
I also love witnessing the competition for number of recommendations. I love it. I just think it really speaks to the commitment and the hard work that this task force is bringing every day to work. And so what, what Kate and I and Martha McKenna, your team at McKenna Media are doing now are essentially we're operating in a way that really mirrors the way that you all are working in your report phases. So now that we have got this sort of first phase um, almost completed and ready for release on Monday, apart from releasing that report, which I'll talk about in a moment, we also want to take a lot of the individual recommendations, the different stories that are being told within these recommendations about the commitment to improving people's lives in the county, more efficient public services, and tell those stories in different outlets. So we're looking at little web videos, some maybe Facebook interviews with some of you, um, newsletters, any sort of place where we think that we have an opportunity to sort of grab the attention of reporters and residents so that they are really learning about the work of the task force and all these, this, these, really, these great recommendations that are gonna really hopefully make people's lives better during this pandemic and in the years to come. So sort of, and always, you know, we're always, our goal here is always be driving people to our website, to the princegeorgesforward.com. So where all of this information is read, readily available and accessible and digestible to, to, to everyone. So you sort of first things first, with the release of the report on Monday, we are looking to um, release this to reporters Monday afternoon with our co-chairs and our subcommittee chairs. So we were tentatively talking about the afternoon. I know that sort of David and his team working with your program managers are trying to figure out that the best time that works for everybody. Um, and then, and that will be our opportunity to really showcase the report, showcase the website and showcase the work that and the commitment that all this task force has. Um, just sort of as a little uh, sausage making point to that press conference, or not a conference, press call, press briefing um, that we'll be hosting on Monday afternoon, we'll look to try to find some time Friday afternoon just to bring our subcommittee chairs or their program managers together with the co-chairs and, and, and the communications team just to make sure we're clear about how that, um, how that, pre that press briefing is going to run straightforward. Um, and then from there, while you all work on the next phase of the report, um, so Kate and Martha and I are really digging into these uh, now 39 recommendations and coming up with different press opportunities for, for your different work groups. So you can expect to hear in the weeks to come from your program manager, from sort of David and the leadership team about different opportunities that we think we can create to lift up some of these important highlights. So again, it's such a dynamic ongoing piece of work and we want the communications work and the public relations of this task force to really reflect that. So the work goes on and we're coming right in behind you to showcase and lift up the recommendations. Important in all of this, and the last thing I wanna say here is that we are always looking for moments when we can send to you a social media toolkit, right? So that you can take some of the ideas, some of the language um, and, and put it on your own feeds on, and lift it up in your own social media outlets with your own followers. So look for those to definitely happen on Monday after we release the report. And then when we have other opportunities that we, where we wanna show the public that we're continuing to work and working towards the next phase of this report. Um, so for example, next week after the report is released on Monday, later in the week, we are working right now with our co-chairs and with County Executive Also Brooks to create a very short video for um, potentially her Facebook page that will talk about the release of this report and what residents could expect to find inside this report. And we'll definitely share that with all of you so that you can go to her Facebook page and then share it onto your Facebook page as well. But all of this will come in sort of um, easy to digest toolkit packets that we'll send to you. So happy to answer any questions and really look forward to taking these 39 recommendations and moving them out there in the world. So I will say to you, uh, Ms. O'Connell, that easy to digest works for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, for those who may not want to admit it themselves, I will be the first to admit that easy works for me. So uh, thank you for that. Are there any questions with regard to um, the, the media and communication strategies? 
Dr. Dukes? Yes. If I may, it was the brief comment. I think um, to speak uh, for the entire team, we appreciate everyone being um, flexible to date, but our communication strategy will require even more flexibility as we really get into the coming weeks. Uh, and we appreciate in advance your ability to move quickly with us as we try and highlight what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we are, we continue to learn every day relative to how we're communicating with the task force, how we're communicating with the public, and just making sure that we're adhering to our timelines. And part of that timeline is, is uh, making sure that we're communicating with the subcommittee chairs and then the full task force so that you are aware when things are going to be made public and uh, you'll be able to uh, certainly communicate and answer any questions as is appropriate based upon the uh, communication strategy. So we appreciate that. Thanks, David. And I will say to you, I would be remiss. You know, we've talked about thanking the full task force for your work. And we also know the task forces are supported by a um, bevy of individuals across county government, the, the uh, deputy chief administrative officers, their teams, uh, teams from the office that David Sloan is responsible for, uh, Glenda Wilson, Miriam Brewer, uh, Linda Turner, we could go on and on and on. You all should know that we are meeting, um, I wanna say daily, but maybe it's every other day. Uh, it just depends on what uh, information we're trying to secure and how we're working really hard to move things forward and get answers in such a way that um, you recognize, that we recognize, that we applaud and appreciate the time and energy that each one of you is putting into this work. And it's all about the almost 1 million residents who uh, choose to live and, and play and uh, we hope work, even though we know many people work across the region uh, in Prince George's County. So uh, if there are no other questions or comments, what I'd like to do is just to remind us that the uh, meetings are recorded and will serve as the official minutes of the uh, September 30th meeting. That recording will be placed upon, on our website, www.princegeorgesforward.com. And for any member of the public, uh, please email us with your questions or your comments, your perspectives at pathforward at co.pg.md.us. Again, that's pathforward, P-A-T-H-F-O-R-W-A-R-D at co.pg.md.us. We wanna thank everyone for being on the meeting today. We know that as, as the full task force is concerned, this was a little off of our regular schedule. So for those of you who could make it, we're appreciative of that. And uh, we wanted to ensure that you all had the privilege of hearing those approved quick wins uh, prior to our public release. So thank you again. Please enjoy the rest of your day and uh, keep working on those short-term recommendations. Take care, everyone. Take care.